Um, hello, everyone. Uh, it is uh, 4 04. Uh, we're going to get started. Thank you for joining us this afternoon for the uh, Gapaba Small and Solo Firm Committee's uh, Zoom discussion on uh, the PPP, in particular, the forgiveness uh, that comes with it, loan forgiveness, and the uh, also CARES Act and uh, business interruption issues that have arisen from the COVID pandemic. Now, I have the pleasure of introducing uh, two of my fellow uh, Solo Small Firm Committee uh, members uh, who are going to be moderating today. Uh, the first is Jungwook Lee, who is a small solo practitioner in Duluth, and she is one of the co-chairs, along with myself, uh, for the Small Solo Firm Committee. And the other is Daniel Park, who is a a uh, newly minted partner with uh, Berman Fink Van Horn, uh, focusing at, in uh, real estate litigation, business litigation uh, in Atlanta, Georgia. Okay. Hey there, uh, this is Daniel Park. Um, as Alan said, appreciate that. Um, I'm a partner at Berman Fink Van Horn and also a co-chair of the Solo Small Firm Committee um, of Gapaba. Uh, a, a little bit of background on me, um, I uh, am a business litigator uh, representing employers and um, employers um, and business owners and all aspects of business disputes, including um, you know, simple breaches of contract, restrictive covenant and trade secret litigation, um, and business divorces. Um, I'm here today to introduce Stephen Gu who will be discussing PPP forgiveness and how to help your clients take care of, how to um, help your clients take advantage of the CARES Act to get through COVID-19. Um, as a brief introduction, uh, Stephen is both a licensed CPA and attorney with over 12 years of experience in tax and accounting. Um, he's worked with businesses from startups to established middle market companies uh, and Fortune 500 companies. Um, his mission is to educate himself and implement strategies to support the growth of small and medium sized businesses. Um, and he achieves this by helping businesses significantly cut their number one profit killer, which is taxes. Um, so he offers tax strategies to legally reduce the client's income taxes. Stephen also serves as a profitability coach and fractional CFO for his clients and helps them make strategic informed financial decisions to grow every year. Um, as one example, one of his cl current clients grew from a $2 million to $20 million company uh, within 13 month months with his assistance. Um, as Steven starts his presentation, um, if, if any of you have questions, feel free to uh, go ahead and send them by chat to me directly um, so that we can go through them at the end of the presentation. Um, and then real quickly, um, I've got one fun fact about Stephen. Uh, Stephen first came to the United States 20 years ago, arriving at Amarillo, Texas. And as the only Asian around at the time, he considered himself the sole Asian cowboy of Amarillo, Texas. Um, and with that, I will throw it over to Stephen. Thank you for the introduction, and, uh, and it's a great honor to join Kapala uh, and discuss with my colleagues how to help you and your clients to go through this uh, COVID-19. Let me share my screen. So uh, really today I wanted to discuss a little bit and you know, share my uh, some knowledge about how to help your client go through this COVID-19 and take it, you know, how the PPP forgiveness is working and how to help your client take advantage of the care sack to go through the COVID-19. And uh, as we, as all of our lawyers like, you know, with lots of disclaimers, basically you cannot trust whatever I'll say today. Uh, it's no tax opinion, okay. And uh, now I think, uh, I believe majority of our here, uh, you already got a PPP loan. If you have not, you still have up until August 8th to apply for the PPP loan. And uh, once you get the loan, it's time to think about how to make sure lo your loan is forgiven, right? So that you don't have to pay back. 
so there are some questions. You have to really proper planning and monitoring how do you use the funds, right? For example, if you got a hundred thousand dollars of PPP loan, if you got a zero forgiveness, you have to pay everything back. If you got a 50 forgiveness, you have to you can use 50 and you have to pay back half. But if you got a hundred percent forgiven, you don't have to pay back everything, right? So that's that's our goal. You make sure you do not have to pay pay back everything, right? Anything. So hold on. I might screen keep on. Right. But uh, keep in mind that forgiveness does not happen automatically. You have to follow the rules. Uh, now, here's a, these are the legal authorities are summarized here and also the time frame. Uh, President Trump announced the pandemic declaration on March 13th, and then we have the F F uh, Family First Act. Basically, it, uh, it, uh, it offers paid sick and the family leave, and uh, that act also gave like 700, $700 million of funding to the EID, Economic Injury Disaster, that's, that is a 7B program. And then on March 27th, the CARES Act was signed into the law and the Section 1102 of the CARES Act adds the Paycheck Protection Program to the SBS 7A loan program. That's where the CARES Act comes from. And then Section 1106 provides the, the provides the forgiveness to the PDP loan. And then, of course, there are lots of Treasury and the SBA, there are lots of rulings and the QNS. I believe they issued more than 20 rules and the QNS because at times the rules just passed, there are lots of ambiguity. So uh, they provide lots of implementation details. And then on April 24th, three weeks after the care sack, the money was run out. So they, they passed a new law under the PPP and the Health Care Enhancement Act. And they basically they provide additional fundings. Uh, this is what we call a so-called second law. And on June seventh, uh, on June fifth, the PPP Forgiveness Act was signed into law. Basically, it amends the CARES Act and it provided more flexibilities on how to apply the law, how to use the law, and how to get the forgive, how to get uh, the law forgiven. And also, it follows by lots of uh, rulings and uh, Q and A's uh, on the on the forgiveness details. Uh, no. Forgiveness on the PPP loan, there are three commands, remember. There are lots of details, but the three big rules we have to remember. First is, you will owe money uh, if your loan is due, and if you, and if you, if you use, your, use your loan amount other than payroll costs, mortgage interest, rent, and utilities. And uh, you have eight weeks, you have eight weeks to, to, um, to use the loan, but the PPP Act, PPP Act extended from 24 weeks. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, you have uh, you have eight weeks to to spend the money, or and then PPP Care Flexible Flexibility Act extended to 24 weeks. And the second one is second. Uh, the covered period of eight or 24 weeks begins on the date you receive the money from the lender. And the second rule is you, you will owe money if you don't spend more than 25% of your loan on your payroll cost. And uh, the payroll cost versus other costs have to be at least a 25, 75-25 uh, 25, spread. But a Flexibility Act changed the rule to the 60% and the 40%. So now, you, you only require to spend more than 60% of the fund on the payroll cost. And the third portion is you, you, will, you will owe money if you do not maintain your staff and the payroll level, right? What does this mean? So first you have to maintain your staff level. Uh, your, your forgiveness will be reduced if you decrease your full-time employment headcount. And uh, how that works, you have to compare your average number of full-time full -time equivalent per month. You have to compare that number to January 1st, 2020, to February 29, 2020. So first two months uh, of the 2020. Or you can, you can use a number of, uh, from February 25th, 2019, through June 30th, 2019. Now for seasonal business, you have different numbers to compare. Uh, keep in mind is that full-time equivalent, the definition of full-time equivalent, how the character is a little bit different from the definition from the labor law. Uh, for PPP forgiveness purpose, uh, how we calculate full-time equivalent is you use the hours uh, your employee works divided by 40. That's how you calculate FTEs. But for department labor, you divide it by 30. 
And also, uh, you have to maintain the level of pay. If your loan forgiveness will be reduced if you decrease the salary and wages by more than 25%. And this, is, this, is, this will be calculated based on employee level, employee by employee. And the third one, you have to be high. You have to make sure uh, you have up until June 30th or December 31st to restore your full-time employment. Uh, depends which cover period you submit. So here's an example. You don't have to look at the detailed number, but just look at those two green numbers. So let's say you've got a loan of $40,000 and your payroll expense is 85% and you have 10 full-time equipment. So if, if you know, at the end of the day, you, there's the number percentage and the uh, uh, full-time equipment number does not change, so you've got 100% uh, forgiven. Forgive and now, if your payroll expense is only 65%, but your full-time equipment is 10%, I mean, it's still 10, 10 people doesn't, doesn't reduce, you will have $7,000 being, uh, you have to pay back. And uh, if, let's say the payroll cost counts more than uh, uh, 87%, but your employee has been reduced to nine people, then you have to pay back $3,000. This is a very, very simplified example. So, now the key to the uh, to get the forgiveness, there's a few uh, a, a few important points. One is you have to get a complete and accurate financial record on how your money has been dispersed. You have to track your employees' both numbers and uh, salary, right? And you have to determine how much you need and if you need more, right? And then you have to consider communicate with the vendors and sort of uh, keep yourself updated on the changes on the in, in the law regarding the forgiveness. And uh, here's the seven steps we recommend to all our clients. One is you know, make a plan, right? Uh, second is you have to determine the eligible costs incurred and paid during the next eight or 24 weeks, depends on which cover period you select. And you have to calculate the employee flow for the forgiveness. And you have to determine the percentage of decrease in the full-time equivalent during the, during the cover period. And then you have to calculate the reduction in the payroll uh, make sure it's, uh, uh, to make sure it's, uh, uh, to decide if it's uh, reduced more than 25%. And then you have to look at how many employees you have, how many changes, right? And then they have to make sure you restore the bike in 30 to December 31st. And you have to prepare a final package, send it to the bank, and you have to communicate, communicate with the lenders and the SBAs. So the consequence of not getting this round is pretty significant. So even if you use the money for other legitimate business purpose, or you spend it on the wrong kind of payroll, that amount will not be forgiven. And that amount you have to pay back. And uh, if this is done incorrectly, this will be converted to a real loan. And unfortunately, uh, we predict there are many businesses will screw this thing up, and eventually they're going to pay, you know, pay the money back. And here are additional some actual items to help you to uh, help you and your client to uh, achieve the maximum uh, forgiveness. What is run a budget calculation based on, the, uh, based on the nature of the expense and also look at the employment situation during the coming period. Here's an example. Once you receive the money, uh, just putting it uh, spreadsheet, if, it's, uh, you don't have, if you don't have too many employees, just put on a spreadsheet, record that, and whenever you have expenses, you just keep putting, just keep adding there, okay? On a, your payroll, your expense, the electricity, whatever, just, just, just add to the expression. And for each expense, you have to make sure you put it, you can put it in a Google Drive folder, just load all your documents in the folder. And uh, each document you have support, uh, you have the, uh, you, you, you make sure you have the supportings, right? Just load everything there. And make sure at the end of the day, you will get a zero remaining so that you, know, you can submit to the bank. And the bank will be very happy to see this kind of support because imagine they will handle millions of applicants and uh, they would love to see this, so you will get the fastest forgiven. Now, this is just a simple example. The real forgiveness application is quite complicated. It's 11 pages. That's like a mini tax return, right? This is uh, uh, because you, have to, you do have to calculate page by page. I mean, employee by employee, you have lots of form to fill out. So I summarize into how, how everything works together. You have to look at all the costs. You have to calculate a safe, you know, safe harbor base. Uh, um, and then you have, you have to look at a wage, uh, wage reduction, compensation, other costs, and then you have to do comparison in order to reach the conclusion. And uh, also the document you need to submit to the bank is quite a lot. You have to submit the payroll report, all the, all the you know, health insurance, all, all the costs related. So here's a detailed example of how it works. Uh, 
so this is like if you if you and all your client have let's say more than 10 people this thing gonna get quite complicated because you have to you have to examine your uh, your situation employee by employee right so this is actually how we calculate for our clients if they have more 10 people really you know you have to track them uh, loss of calculation and then at the end of the day we want to make sure we have zero balance remaining you don't have to pay back anything right so that's all the forgiveness a quick sort of practical tips and i also want to mention something about you know ppp is really a temporary fix right you we don't expect the government going to keep giving the money to the people so then you know, once we use the money, what are we going to expect? What, what, what's next, right? And it looks like the second wave will keep coming in, right? And we don't really know what's the economic going to uh, where people come in a U-shape, V-shape, or L-shape, right? And uh, even, even the uh, Fed said it could be a W-shape, right? So really, we have to plan ourselves. We have to make sure our client, there's a, uh, there's, what's the other resource available for, for, for you and for, other, for our clients? So I wanted to talk to mention about a little bit of other things, uh, talk about other lending options uh, and the tax planning. Now we talked to, no, we talked a lot about EID and PPP, but people forgot there's also other uh, lending available from the bank, from SDA, from state government, from local government, even channel of commerce, non-bank lenders, right? So, and also even cities, states, they offer loans and uh, grants similar to PPP. Right, even like a, where we are located in Cornet County, we Cornet uh, also have a PPP, uh, si uh, uh, some some grant option available, uh, similar to the PPP. And also recently, the the mainstream lending is open up. You can your client can uh, apply five years term. Uh, uh, the the size will be two hundred fifty thousand dollars to three hundred million, and it's a liver plus two point uh, three point five. It's very. Uh, it's, it's a very attractive as well, and the interest rate is pretty low, so this is something you can consider for your clients as well. And uh, another thing is, uh, you can also consider help your client to take advantage of the new legislation related to CARES Act and the Family First Act. There's lots of incentives um, and the tax relief available. Now, on, care, the, on CARES Act and, uh, uh, and the Family First Act, uh, there may be more act will be available. So, for example, you can defer 100% of the uh, payroll tax for two years, and uh, you can, if you have NOL, you can you can cash those NOL generally rebate to support your current you know, cash situation, right? And uh, you also have employee retention credit, you know, up to $10,000 uh, per employee, right? And uh, you can also get the money out of the retirement account up to $100,000 tax free. So, here are a few things uh, available, and uh, and also like. Uh, no, I feel like for lots of our clients, I feel the biggest problem for them, regarding the taxes, they don't, it's, it's, it's the, their mindset. You know, lots, of people, lots of people think you know, they already have a CPA, they already have a, a accountant to help them to prepare the tax. They sort of, they are saving tax. But actually they are not. They are really just doing the uh, tax preparation, right? So lots of our clients, they don't understand the tax preparation and the tax planning, right? Tax planning is, uh, tax preparation is, happens, the year end, you just get the information, put it into software, send it to IS, right? But tax planning is you do before the year end, you look at a person's life, business, and the regulatory requirement to legally reduce the tax. And those could be like uh, for, for quite a few years, right? So here's one example we did for, for a physician. Uh, you know, left column is uh, before tax planning, right column is after tax planning. Originally, he owns $130, $139,000. We did some planning, we did some tax free for, uh, boardroom, meeting and income shifting and we did some 401k we did some prepared expense so that he can before he does not got as a qualified business income condition qbi and lots of lawyers too uh, we do not get a, a qbis but after this strategy we were able to get additional qbis so at the end of the day he will reduce from 139 thousand dollars to 99 thousand dollars so the tax saving is 39 thousand dollars it's a very simple easy tax planning very simple strategy and this is the example, because this, this is a real last minute saving story. I just did this yesterday. Uh, before uh, one client come to me, asked me to look at his return. So I did a quick look. Just one strategy saved him $13,000, really last minute. So these are the main things I wanted to cover. And uh, one last thing is really, you know, think, uh, sometimes we can think outside the box. This is a full dining room and they convert into a mini location. Really how to think about how to reinvest the, reinvest the cost structure with low expense and a new income stream. So these are, this is all my, this is all I have.
and here's my um, contact information. Appreciate that, Stephen. Um, we, we've got a few questions um, that we've got from the chat. Um, the first one being, will you be able to share the uh, PowerPoint presentation with the attendees? Yeah, I can share the uh, first few slides, yeah. I can share some of those. Yeah, we'll, we'll make sure to circulate that yeah. um, to you all. Um, we've got another question here that asked if, can I use the 10 week or 12 weeks? Um, and I think that's in, in reference to the percent decrease in FTE's calculation. Um, you mean, even, go ahead. eight week versus 24 weeks, right? And I think the question was, is it possible to use 10 weeks or, or 12 weeks? Or does it have to be eight or 24? Oh, no, you have to be, you have to, well, you have to use eight weeks or 24 weeks. That's called a cover period. So you have to decide yourself. For example, for our solo uh, firm, if you, if you got it, if you apply, because the older law is you got a two and a half months of PPP money and you have to spend within two, two months. So you always have a half months of funding left, right? So the problem at the time is like, oh, how can I, how can I spend all this money? And, uh, and also like you have up until June 30 to rehire all your employees, but a lot of the employees, they are not ready to come back to work. Or they got, a, they got the unemployment benefits. They don't want to come back because they are paid like, uh, in California, they paid like almost like $4,000, right? So that's why the Flexibility Act come, comes in and said, okay, now I will extend it from eight weeks to 24 weeks. So you can decide when you want to make money and it give you enough time to hire back uh, the employees, right? And the purpose of the Flexibility Act is really try to almost try to convert this PPP law into a grant program. So give you enough time to spend it. So for, for our solo firm, I would highly suggest you think, you know, if you've got a, typically for us, we, you know, our application will be up to, you know, up to a hundred thousand dollars. That's the maximum salary, right? Uh, the other cap. So typically we got like a 20, maybe $22,000. And, uh, if we, if you use eight weeks, you can only got like, uh, you know, uh, maybe $20,000 for giving, you have to give back $2,000. But uh, for those, if you can, if you can switch to 24 weeks, so you can get extra, you know, two or $3,000. But uh, for bigger firm and uh, bigger companies, it seems to be different. Um, we've, got, we've got one more question here, Stephen. Um, will the forgiveness be reduced if I also was approved for EDIL? EID will, if you, EID, yes, EID will be counted as your uh, uh, PPP, yes. Okay. Um, well, Stephen, we appreciate it. Um, to, we, we appreciate it very much, um, you taking your time to give that presentation. Um, we, we know this was a high level overview, so if, if anyone of you attendees have any follow up questions or want to talk to Stephen directly, I, I think we'll be putting up his information again later on. Um, to provide his contact information. And, and with that, I'm going to throw it over Thank to Thank you, Daniel Tony. and uh, Stephen, for that uh, very useful information. Um, the second half of our presentation will be, um, I'll be moderating a discussion with uh, Ms. Min Ku, and she'll be talking about the uh, business interruption claims during the times of COVID-19. Um, Min started her career as a uh, insurance defense attorney and over the years uh, she has developed a specialty litigating insurance coverage matters. She has litigated insurance coverage cases on behalf of the, some of the biggest insurance companies in the country including AIG, Mag Mutual, Farm Bureau and others and has won a, a number of coverage cases in the Georgia Court of Appeals and the 11th Circuit. Min's career then took her over to South Korea where she spent the next several years working as a global general counsel for Samsung Fire and Marine Insurance Company overseeing all coverage issues on behalf of the company. She is currently the managing partner of Infinity Trial Group and represents uh, injured victims from the plaintiff side. Um, Bonnie has helped us uh, to uh, have uh, some fun fact about Min. 
So she has uh, two other siblings and she's the eldest where uh, there is a considerable age gap. So this one here, um, she's confused <laughs> as a cougar sister slash girlfriend. This is a picture with her younger brother who is what, seven years younger than her? Uh, she 10, okay. Uh, so when she went, goes out, people think that either uh, she is uh, his girlfriend. Um, and then she has a younger sister who is 17 years younger than you. 19, yeah, close. 19, okay. <laughs> so recently uh, Min was uh, helping her younger sister purchase a car and the, the dealership thought that uh, she was uh, buying, helping buy a car for her uh, sister, yes. for her daughter rather than her sister. So she could be confused as a cooler sister and mom. Um, she's a double bulldog. She graduated undergrad and law school from University of Georgia. So here uh, to talk about the business interruption claims in the time of COVID-19, um, I'll give the floor to Min. Thanks, Jungwook. Uh, let me uh, go ahead and share my screen. Um, um, so I am going to be talking about uh, business interruption claims during the times of COVID-19 and some of the issues surrounding COVID-19 in general. Um, the agenda for my topic will cover basic components of the business owner's policy, uh, where the business income or interruption coverage contains. Um, and we're going to look into special endorsements and basically other avenues to make uh, your business income interruption coverage claims. Also, in conjunction with that is there's a clause um, clause coverage that uh, call, that's called the civil or military authority coverage that is applicable to these times when civil orders have been given for certain business closures and strict um, operations in certain circumstances. And that might be an avenue for us to also make a claim for business interruption claims. Um, there is the, 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 the topic that is going to be uh, discussed at length in these claims is that whether there is a physical loss or damage to the insured property. So we'll look into that. And obviously there are a lot of uh, exclusions that are applicable on these business policies that the insurance companies are currently um, alleging to deny all these claims. So we're looking into those exclusions as well. And we will also obviously cover, uh, if you are able to make a business interruption coverage, what is it included and what does it not cover? And lastly, on the flip side, if your business, um, if you or your client's business is uh, facing a COVID-19 claim, we'll just do a very brief overview as to um, how to handle those. So the business owner's policy is basically a property business policy combined with liability insurance into one effective policy. It covers everything from theft, fire, natural disasters, and riots. So if you have clients who's um, facing property damage from these riots or protests, uh, that is a sure way to get some coverage under these policies. It also obviously covers bodily injury claims and third party claims uh, with lawsuits and even advertising injuries in certain circumstances. It, it can be customized to cover specific need particular to a field. So if something like data breach or professional liability is a, is a huge concern, you can customize your policy to cover those risks. The business income and the business interruption coverage in particular, and this is a sample, very uh, normal standard, if you will, uh, clause contained in these policies. And basically what that says is that the insurance company will pay for the actual loss of the business income that you sustain during the suspension of your operations during the period restoration. And the suspension, suspension must be caused by the direct physical loss damage or destruction to the insured property. And that of course the damage or the loss has to be the result of a covered cause. So there are basically three major components. The suspension, and the suspension is a particular uh, 
emphasis in this kind of clauses because you have to look to your particular policy to see whether the suspension actually means a closure or a reduction to a certain level of operations. So it could it mean that it's uh, if your business is running still at 80%, uh, they may not consider that a suspension of operations under the policy in particular, and it has to be something below 50% for that to actually be triggered. On the, uh, the second component is really the one that's going to be the heart of the issue with these claims, whether there is actually a physical loss or damage or destruction to the insured property. There has to be a property damage claim according to these uh, business interruption coverage clauses. And lastly, obviously, whether even if there is a property damage, if that damage didn't come from a covered cause, they're still going to deny the claim. Now, so the checking for a specialty endorsement in these cases is going to be a key because um, if you have a specialty endorsement that provides some sort of a, like an pandemic or some sort of a virus coverage, um, there is a very, uh, it's going to be an easier fight to make these claims with the insurance companies. For example, uh, following the uh, 2013 Ebola epidemic, some of the insurance companies like Lloyds of London offered pandemic disease business interruption insurance. And those are sort of tailored for situations like this, where you can go ahead and easily get a lot of your expenses covered. Now, in response to COVID-19, in February of 2020, just a few months ago, the Insurance Services Office developed two new endorsements forms that deals particularly with coronavirus. And it's gonna be called it is called business interruption limited coverage for certain civil authority orders relating to coronavirus. So if you've got clients coming up that's renewing their business owners policies, these are some of the endorsements you wanna look for and see if you can obtain it. If you're foreseeing that your client's gonna have continued business losses as a result of this COVID-19 situation, it's worth looking into it and possibly adding that to your coverage. So looking specifically at COVID-19 losses, will it be covered? It's still up in the air. There's not a whole lot of decision out there guiding uh, what's gonna happen with these insurance companies, but the insurance companies have been very uniform. They have taken a very hard stance in denying all these business inter interruption claims outright because they're saying you need to have sustained physical damage to insured property. And what they're saying is, is that the threat of contamination is not physical damage to insured property. They need something like damage to the insured premises, the building, equipment, or something to that nature that is deemed a loss or destruction to the insured property. Now, you can also claim interruption if it's not just your business, but if the nearby business that is related to your business uh, suffers uh, business uh, damages or physical damage to their property. So if, for example, if the city or the local government has shut down businesses around you and that has reduced your business operations as a result, you can also claim business interruption claims under this policy. Um, and also, if you have something um, called contingent business interruption, or commonly known as a supply chain coverage, you can also make a claim for business interruption under that theory. And the way that coverage works is that if a vendor that supplies to your business has been affected by some sort of a loss that affects their business, which in turn impacts uh, your business loss, then that is sufficient to qualify as your business interruption and make a claim under that theory. Now, the only caveat is that the business physical loss that your supplier or your vendor suffers has to be the same kind of, uh, same kind of covered event that's covered under your policy. Meaning, if you were in the shoes of the vendor, or the supplier that has suffered that harm, you would be covered. That's the theory that even if it extends, it has to be a same covered event caused. Now that also goes for the receivers as well. So if your client is the supplier 
or providing goods and services to another receiver and the receiver is all of a sudden having difficulty with their business and says, hey, we can no longer get the shipments from you. So we're gonna have to cut back and we can't, we can't operate like this. Then you're not gonna be able to make the same kind of income obviously because your biggest receivers are no longer taking business from you. That can also be a business interruption on the flip end and you can make a claim for a business interruption claim. The most common situation we have going on right now is that we've got government authority basically restricting businesses and ordering closures in certain events. And that's been the biggest impact for a lot of business owners. Now, the thing about these civil or military authority orders is that the order has to effectively deny or prohibit the access to the insured premises. So for example, the government authority has to say, you know, you can no longer travel in these premises or it has to be closed down by a certain time, which means that even though they're not closing the insured business down uh, directly, it has the effect of prohibiting customers from getting to the insured premises. And it has to be an order. It can't be, uh, we are advising that the business owners do not operate. Something of that nature has been held, held insufficient to uh, trigger this, uh, this clause. And also certain business owners I know have taken um, a cautious step in voluntarily extending the closure. And in that case, the insurance companies may not necessarily deem that the clause has been triggered. Another thing about this uh, civil authority clause is that it's still in most clauses is worded so that it still requires a physical damage. But um, all is not lost on that front. There are cases in other jurisdictions where it has been held, uh, like much like when uh, the Atlanta mayor has uh, uh, put in force the 9 p.m. curfew for a few days or um, those kind of limitations, uh, riot curfews have been held sufficient in certain courts to say that is enough of an order restricting operations of business to interrupt the business operations to allow for business interruption claims on insurance policies. There are generally some conditions of that. So it's not necessarily <clears throat> like here where we have months of pandemic going on. Usually it's relegated to about 30 consecutive days of coverage. And there's a couple of waiting period as well. So you wanna look to make sure uh, that even if you have the physical damage that you can get the coverage period uh, noted. Now, so this all sounds like COVID-19 cases or claims for business interruption may not survive because most people don't have any physical losses or damage to their property. But I think it's worth a second look for the reasons that I'm about to tell you, which is that traditionally the interpretation of loss or damage to property has been uh, included to interpret it as the property not being usable, meaning, if it's contaminated to the point where it becomes unhabitable, it is damaged property. And of course, there's a growing body of scientific evidence these days that indicates that COVID-19 can survive for days. And if that's the, if that's the case, and if you've got a business owner who may be uh, suspecting that their insured premises are possibly contaminated, that means that for at least several days until they get all the cleaning done and disinfected, uh, that place is not usable and habitable for occupation of their business. So in that case, is, we may have a way to make the claim and say there has been a <clears throat> physical loss or damage to property that has been met to trigger this, this uh, uh, policy. Likewise, there are a couple of other cases from other jurisdictions that I've cited where it says, you know, um, if it's unusable by other forces, even if there's no physical damage to the insured property, it is sufficient to trigger uh, the coverage. And also um, in a Port Authority of New York and New Jersey case, they have said the physical loss or damage requirement has been met where asbestos was adequate to render the property uninhabitable and the business interruption claim was allowed to proceed. Also, some of the business obviously are located near uh, 
arenas, theaters, cultural attractions. And if that's the case, and those obviously venues have been closed as a result of COVID-19, and your business is very uh, related to how those venues perform, there might be an attraction property coverage that applies to you that you can take advantage of as a result of um, COVID-19 and, and use it as another venue to make these business interruption claims. Now, so obviously you may have heard that there are pollutants, bacteria, contaminant exclusions that are often uh, put on the back of these business owners' policies. But I want to point out that these exclusions shouldn't be taken at face value and is worth reviewing them very, very closely. So for example, if you look at it and think pollutants, any contaminants, anything that really, uh, that are not physical property, um, physical damaging causing sort of uh, factors uh, are all excluded. You think that COVID-19 may possibly fall into that category. And some of the insurance companies are making that argument, but you wanna be very, very careful and make, make sure that these exclusions actually contain the word virus because bacteria is living organism where as opposed to virus, which is a non-cellular strands of DNA that doesn't have the same uh, characteristics and properties of a bacteria. So if you've got a bacteria or some sort of other pollutant, which obviously uh, COVID-19 is also not, if you've got those exclusions, don't let the insurance companies lump the virus in there and says, hey, this exclusion applies to exclude your business interruption claim. So I think that's also a point that uh, we could argue that doesn't apply and the claim should go forward. Also, look at how the, the contaminants or a bacteria, or even when you have a virus exclusion, look into how it's supposed to um, spread or uh, transferred. If you say, if you see the exclusion language where it says the virus, if it releases, escapes, discharges, or dispersal, uh, these are not the sort of the terms that you would expect to use with a virus. Obviously, a virus is a, is a transmission uh, virus, and this is not the sort of the language you would use to do that, meaning that the virus like this was not contemplated to be applicable for an exclusion when they uh, written it up. And when there is a gray area for any sort of exclusions, obviously the interpretation rules allow for greater coverage in favor of the insured, so it's also worth the fight. Now, think bigger, even if certain businesses had to shut down because of the threat of COVID-19 without anybody actually being infected or contaminations actually being found in the business, that may be still be enough for a trigger. Um, there are cases in other jurisdictions where they have said that the threat of a covered event occurring or threat of serious business interruption was sometimes in certain circumstances sufficient to allow the claim to go forward. So if you actually get to a point where you can make the business interruption claim, what is it covered? Mortgages and rent payments. And if for some reason, if there's actually some physical damage to your business where you have to relocate to another location, those temporary location costs are also covered. Also, if you have any sort of loan payments or tax payments that are being due during this period of restoration, those are also covered. Obviously the loss of net income or profit during the period of restoration is covered, as well as employee wages, payroll, and any sort of fixed expenses and utilities are often all covered under the business interruption claims. So what is not covered? Uh, losses that can be mitigated. For example, if you could have saved um, or continue to operate your business, perhaps at a reduced capacity, but if you have another location and you could have carried on that location and continued to operate it, even at you know, perhaps 50%, and you just chose not to do that, that kind of losses, the insurance company will probably argue that you should have mitigated because you still, it's still better to actually have 50% of profit than not at all. Also, if you have insurance payments, those are outside and not considered 
uh, damages flowing from restoration periods, so those are on your own to pay. Um, other expenses such as marketing, these are all seen as just sort of ongoing expenses that are not necessarily um, related to business interruption. And flood and earthquake, um, usually these are covered by a separate uh, policies. So these will not be covered. And obviously any undocumented income that you can't show, even if it, you know, even if it flowed from it, uh, you won't be able to recover. So actually these are the process of how you really, in just three broad strokes, how you go about making your business interruption claim. So the first thing you need to do is check the claim filing and document submission deadlines. Um, basically, in all the policies, these deadlines exist, um, whether it be an auto policy or these kind of commercial policies or business owners policy. There's always a claim when you have to notify the insurance company of the claim itself that you, you have suffered a loss of some sort. And um, in these cases, you actually have a separate deadline to submit your uh, documents. And you don't want to get your claim denied on a technicality, so you want to make sure that you um, note these deadlines and follow through. Um, you also have to preserve and prevent further damage. So document everything that you suffered in terms of uh, losses, whether it be financial or physical, if you have a physical losses. You obviously want to take pictures of it and do not throw away anything in terms of a physical damage that you can um, preserve because the insurance companies oftentimes say, hey, we want a time uh, to inspect the damage and get our own person to evaluate how much the damage is. is. And obviously, lastly, uh, during this process, you also have to calculate exactly what you are, uh, what you've lost, and what your damages are, and gather all the documentation. And it's going to be cumbersome, so you want to get it started early and make sure you submit everything. So there's some uh, tips I would like to share with you in terms of um, making sure that you come out on top on these making these business interruption claims. And that is keep track of the dates the business was closed or was detrimentally affected by COVID-19. Uh, ensure that you have accurate, timely financial statements prepared on a monthly basis and maintain accurate record of headcount of your employees and the monthly hours worked before during and after, because if you just have one period, the insurance company is not going to uh, know whether this was a reduction in your workforce as a result of COVID-19. So it's very, very important. And this is where some of the people um, make a mistake in thinking that they can be a little bit more general or they can only uh, document the last period. But really, they need the last period, uh, the, the, the last, uh, the before the last period, the last period, and after the loss to show that you are uh, mitigating your damages and with the assistance you're coming, uh, getting, putting the loss behind you. Think of other ways to mitigate your damages. If you need to have new marketing plans, or if you own a restaurant and all of a sudden now because of COVID-19, you have to do more takeouts. You need to adapt your business so that you can mitigate your damages because the insurance company is going to look at what else have you done to not other than just to make a claim, what else have you done to help yourself? Uh, and if you're doing everything you can and still making a claim, that's going to make it easier for you to support your claim. And uh, it's going to be uh, less burdensome for the insurance company to be able to fight your claim. Um, it, this is not necessarily related to the PPP program, but if, if you have <clears throat> the Paycheck Protection Program funds, uh, you wanna ensure that you keep accurate records of when you got the funds, when they were used, and when the forgiveness was received. And the only reason is that the insurance companies are going to take issue with you receiving the Paycheck Protection Program or any sort of other funding, and they're gonna try to use that as a means to either reduce your claim amount or not pay you anything at all, saying there is actually no loss, because you were made whole by these grants or funds. And well, I'll take, talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but that's why in order to combat and preemptively get ready for these kind of arguments, you wanna make sure that if you receive any funding, you keep accurate records of how they were used. 
So just on a, just briefly on the flip side. So if you have been suffering from an interruption of business, but uh, on the flip side, you may be facing a COVID-19 claim. Obviously with any other insurance claims, you wanna notify your insurance company immediately and report all known facts and uh, try to trigger your uh, coverage. And if the contamination may not be covered as an occurrence, uh, it's still worth uh, obviously the effort to tell your insurance company because if nothing else, uh, they do have a duty to defend until they can sort it out. So they'll at least provide you with a defense in any lawsuit. And if the claim is denied or the insurance company is refusing to provide you with a defense, uh, tell your insurance company that you would like to have a personal attorney. They should point one out for you on, uh, and bear the cost on their own, but um, that is something of venue uh, that you really do want to explore before you have to spend your own money obtaining a separate attorney. Um, and uh, as always, with any sort of COVID-19 claims, the importance is that you've taken some safety measures and protocols to protect your business, vendors, and consumers. So that's going to be key. So that's something that you want to be thinking about going forward. So how can you protect your business from COVID-19 claims? Review your policy and familiarize yourself with any coverage conditions and deadlines. Um, add or modify any coverage, especially the new endorsements for COVID-19 that are available now, so that when you renew, you can add those or think about adding those. And also develop a visible plan. And what I mean by visible plan is that plan that people can literally observe, observe when they walk into your business. Have safety measures such as wearing masks and gloves that are mandated within in your business, implementing plastic guards, observing safe social distance within insured premises, and et cetera. Uh, something that everybody will be able to see that you've got a plan in place. Also, make sure that you don't deviate from your uh, visible plan. Make sure that your suppliers and anybody that comes into your business interacts with you follows these safety measures to reduce any sort of COVID-19 claims. So the key takeaways have been, while the COVID-19 loss of use may be sufficient for property damage trigger, it is not an easy fight, obviously. Uh, the insurance as a whole have taken the steps to deny business interruption claims um, related to COVID-19. And if you're looking to uh, sort of the state government order sort of uh, requiring a closure of certain businesses, you also want to make sure that um, that you've done everything you could to take safety measures to operate if necessary, because obviously they also trigger the property damage uh, as well. And then they'll look to see whether you are voluntarily closing uh, your operations. Check for other additional avenues. Obviously the business interrupt interruption, uh, direct clause and any sort of a civil authority clauses are the two main ones that people are tr uh, treading under when they're making these claims. But uh, there is sort of the, um, con you know, contingent business uh, interruption clauses, uh, attraction venue clauses and other avenues to possibly tread your claim under for business interruption. And also uh, don't accept exclusions at face value. Look for the virus exclusion that would be very, very specifically applicable for situations like COVID-19. And obviously, if you do have a claim, make sure you follow all deadlines and documentation requirements um, and uh, just document everything because the more documentation you have, chances are that you're going to have to probably fight these claims a little bit harder with insurance companies. And those are going to come in handy when you actually do have to go beyond the claim stage. So that is all for my presentation. Thank you very much. Um, my office is located in Midtown, and if, have any, if anybody has any questions down the road, uh, I'll be happy to answer them after either uh, in the next few minutes or after the seminar is over. Thank you. Thank you, Min, for that really comprehensive um, overview. We definitely are uh, living in very interesting times, and um, I guess after this, there will be at least a, a page or two that insurance coverage will add onto the fine print to make this very specifically um, excluded. Uh, we do have a couple of questions here. Uh, also, Bonnie mentioned that she has a quick poll question. 
Um, one from Steven was if uh, restaurants and gyms were closed due to COVID-19, can they claim the business interruption? So you did mention that, for example, for restaurants, they do have to do the mitigation. Um, but for like, you know, Korean barbecue or shabu shabu, where mm -hmm. the experience of going out to eat is purely um, cannot be replicated by takeout, you know, I wonder if those uh, businesses would be able to claim, make the claim. Um, I think it's worth the fight for sure. Um, I mean, all the businesses right now that is facing COVID-19 business interruption are sort of in the same boat. Uh, most of them do not have any physical damage or destruction of their own insured property. So then they have to look beyond uh, that physical you know, damages requirement to say, yes, uh, the threat of the virus in conjunction with the fact that the government authorities are either closing or severely restricting operations led to a real loss that's beyond their control. And while the insurance companies are taking the stance that, hey, between the lack of the property damage and all these other um, exclusions that are in place, these are not covered, I think you have to fight it. And I think that's what's going on in a lot of other jurisdictions as well. Uh, there are um, a, a number of these cases that are being filed across the country because the insurance companies have taken a very hard line and just denying all the claims outright. Um, and so there are, uh, there may be an opportunity to actually join class actions in multi-district litigation that are being discussed right now. And in fact, at the end of this month, um, uh, the Judicial Committee on Multi-District Litigations is having a tentatively set a hearing on July 30th to see whether all these cases should be consolidated and uh, managed as a multi-district litigation. So it's not just you know, one or two companies that are having to deal with these kind of um, uh, issues. There are a lot more. And so I think it's especially uh, under the current circumstances and how long this pandemic is lasting, it's worth the fight and making the claim. And uh, even with a, another question was, so even with the virus, virus exclusion, can we still make a claim? Right. Uh, that was the sort of the point I was trying to um, um, make was that even with the virus uh, exclusion, you want to read how it's written because sometimes it's just at the word virus. But really, if you read the entire exclusion as a whole, it is really talking about either pollutants or contaminant uh, or any sort of other bacteria. And the way it's written as a whole indicates that it really wasn't meant to include the viruses in the way that it's being transmitted or how it's uh, affecting the property or the business. So even with the virus exclusion, unless it's really on point with describing the virus, um, I think it's still worth looking at the exclusion again and still proceeding if it doesn't quite uh, address the COVID-19 issues. Okay, well, um... I think we are definitely uh, looking at very unique circumstances. Um, and then also uh, it will be interesting to see how the plaintiff's attorneys are being creative about um, making these uh, claims. So Bonnie has prepared a, a poll. So if you guys want to participate in this poll, uh, go ahead and, and vote. And I don't know if we'll have, okay. So there's a clock ticking here. Bonnie, do you wanna mention briefly about this poll? Yeah, sure. So the questions are just to poll our participants. Have you as a business owner applied for uh, one of the PPP or CARES Act loans? Do you have clients that are applying for PPP loans that are asking you questions? Was your loan approved? And are you now applying for loan forgiveness? And this is maybe to help um, assist Stephen in uh, following up some questions or comments on that. Um, I see a few people who have responded to this and I'll share in just about five or six seconds. So maybe Stephen, you can sort of take what you can from that and then you know, pose questions to the people who responded. Okay. So Stephen, if you want to just um, maybe address any of these issues. 
Yeah, sure. Uh, I see uh, that's the twenty-five percent of people. Uh, two people have not applied a PPP loan. Uh, I highly encourage you to apply because it's still available. And uh, if you properly document and uh, use the money properly, you do not have to pay it back. So it's uh, literally it's a free money. The government try to help you to pay for your employees. Uh, if you are self-employed, they try to give money to you. So definitely. Uh, it's worth, worth trying. And uh, if you don't approve, there's two, I think the 25 people that percent is not approved. I guess those are people who haven't applied yet. And uh, are you not applying? Yes, so yeah. So uh, again, the PPP is definitely uh, worth trying. It's gonna help you to improve your cash cash positions. So if you haven't tried, try. And also, if you already get approved, make sure you follow the steps, follow the rules so that you can get, uh, make sure you get all the money forgiven. Great. And I'm going to launch this quick poll for business interruption. So are you seeking to file COVID-19 business interruption claims or do you have clients who are asking you how to claim these damages? Uh, was your business affected by COVID or the recent riots? Have you filed a COVID-related business interruption insurance claim? And has your business been sued for a COVID claim? Just wondering uh, what the audience polling is like. And Min, I didn't know if you wanted to uh, respond to any of these um, business interruption polling questions or- Sure. Um, I'll just mention a couple of things. Um, just the way it relates to um, uh, PPP loans or any other loans that maybe the, the client has received, um, that should not in any way affect their right uh, to obviously seek uh, business interruption damages. Um, they are going to argue, the insurance companies are going to take the stance that there isn't a damage or it's been ameliorated by these government uh, loans. But um, the, the one thing to keep in mind is that it is a loan. So if, and the insurance company has a contract with you. So that's a contractual obligation for them to pay you for the losses that you suffer that are covered. Um, and that should not have any impact on their obligation where you go out and get a loan from, for example, like a bank, uh, that's not any different. Uh, and in fact, a PPP is just that a loan. And even when you get it forgiven, it becomes a grant, but it, just the fact that, that you get this other money from a different source to support your business has in no way affects the insurance com company's contractual right to pay for the damages that they owe you. So uh, don't let the insurance companies confuse those kind of two pots of money that's different. Um, and, uh, you know, the more claims like this, I think, gets filed, even if it's difficult, even if it's getting denied and they have to be resorted to a lawsuit. It's worth the fight because obviously this is a very um, unprecedented times and insurance companies have not seen these kind of claims being made under these circumstances and neither have the business owners. But I think the business owners have a lot more to lose if they don't make these fights and change how they're interpreted. And there are interpretations in the past that favor uh, for these claims to be granted and given relief. So I think it's definitely worth pursuing, uh, but it is gonna be a hard fight. Okay, well, we're reaching 510. Uh, just wanted to thank all the speakers and also Bonnie for your uh, uh, wizardry like uh, tech support. So I hope that um, all of you who have participated have gained some insight through the seminar. And of course, if you want to reach out to our speakers, um, uh, we'll have the contact information available. Uh, so thank you so much for um, uh, joining us today. And uh, please keep a lookout for our next solo small firm event um, that will be that we're planning right now. Okay, thank you.